or to get them back in school. Um, we want to do that with the least harm to them or and the most return to normal as possible. But we also want to make sure that we're not putting other people at risk. Obviously being sick and the safety of the community is important. Um, Massachusetts sent out a really amazing letter to their community. They worked, their state worked with the Department of Education and Health. And what they found was their data from test to stay program showed that kids, the, the actual um, language says that data from our test to stay program are equally strong about school safety. Students and staff individually identified as asymptomatic close contacts and were repeatedly tested in school through the test to stay program test negative over 90% of the time. As of January 9th, 503,312 test to stay tests have been conducted. 496,440 of them were negative. So 98.6% of the kids that were tested as close contacts were negative. They looked nationwide, and the evidence from California and Illinois, cited by the CDC in their test to state guidance, noted secondary transmission rates of only 0.7 to 1.5%. Massachusetts study found the same thing, that their transmission was, rate was 2.9%. So, the benefit that they came up with in Massachusetts was that there wasn't any. We, we weren't providing a benefit to the community, but what we were doing was continuing to impose on students in the district by making them go down to the nurse, get tested, pulling them out of class, sending them home, having to put the parents through the stress of deciding whether or not they want to test them. I don't know if anybody's been tested routinely. I, I don't enjoy it myself, um, and, but that's a personal opinion. So, the board, uh, I'm leaving it up to the board for discussion. I know there are concerns that not following the New Jersey Department of Health specifically has some potential liability, but there are numerous public health agencies in other states that are showing the data and policies that support a recommendation here for us to get rid of the test to stay and allow for kids to stay in school unless they're sick. If they're sick, go down to the nurse's office. Do you want to get tested? You can test at the nurse's office or you can go home. Um, so I hope you to me one thing on the topic. So our goal is to keep kids in school as much as possible. The best way we can do that is to keep the transmission rate as low as possible within reason. And right now, with the masks off, we know that the transmission rate is going to be easier. It's, you know, just a fact. Airborne disease, the masks off. Okay, there's going to be a chance for public. There's going to be a chance for public comment. So if we can just hold the comments until it's your turn. Can we can please, right. please show Megan the respect to allow her to speak, please? I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the data that you brought up from Massachusetts, um, I've looked at that as well, um, and that data was from when they had masks in place. So the data would be different potentially now that masks are off and it's easier to transmit. Um, on a local level, which is the decision that we're making for our town personally, um, it's important to know that 10% of our test to, kid, to stay kids have tested positive. And that's not a bad thing. It's great because it means we're catching the cases. We're saying those kids now go home, they follow the protocols, they can come back, you know, as soon as now an even shorter time, which is great because it means more days in school, and there's a smaller chance that they're transmitting it to other people who are now going to become symptomatic and now have to stay out for periods of time as well. So the more we can do to prevent the spread within the school, the more our kids can stay in school, and that's really our priority. Um, I also think it's really important from a legal aspect to um, listen to our lawyer and as well as our local health department 
And do you want me to read the letter you sent in, or do you want to read the letter? Okay. Can I, can I just ask you a question? Where did you get that data on our transmission? Because I asked Diane, and I don't know that the state tracks that I asked you for. Sorry, I'm so sorry. We had 52 uh, students that entered test to stay, and uh, five tested positive. It's a low number. I mean, it's a low. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would like to see the data for the state over a great period of time. I mean, I know Middletown found that they had less than 2%. And yes, that's correct that they were wearing masks because that's the only time frame from which we had to operate with. But we are talking about trying to return our kids to normal. Testing them and bringing them down and pulling them out and putting that stuff, the, the chemicals up their nose yeah, every you. other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I didn't, I was not privy to that data. So I, I would like to have seen, um, I mean, it's unfortunate that New Jersey did not do that study itself and work within the Department of Ed and Department of Health to provide clear guidance to the communities like Massachusetts did. Because when you ask Tom, he doesn't have that information. And it's very frustrating for him. So it's really puts us in an awkward position because we don't, now we're trying to decide what's best for our kids and try to get them back to normal because that's what they need. That's why we're having social emotional problems. Exactly. Um, yeah. Do you want to bring in the title? Thank you. So, just to confirm that I saw the, uh, the letter of the excerpt from the uh, local health official. Yeah, can I, is it possible for me to read the letter from our health official before we talk about, sure. refer to it? I just think it would be helpful for transparency for the community to hear what he said um, in its entirety, and then, and then I'd love to hear what Kyle has to say. Um, so this is from Con Tom Cantisano, he's our local health officer. So he's the expert in our community on a local micro level. So what he said is, the policy set forth should reflect the recently released NJDOH guidelines, dated February 22nd, 2022. If a policy is set forth that is inconsistent with said guidelines, we respectfully ask that any reference that suggests the local health department endorses it not be included. It is suggested that any other sources that might have been relied upon to formulate policies not reflective of the NJDOH guidelines be cited. It is true that NJDOH guidelines that are not put forth as executive directives by the Commissioner of Health are only recommendations rather than lawful requirements. Therefore, school districts are empowered to decide which recommended, recommended guidelines should be implemented and which should be ignored. However, it is important to note that by selectively ignoring certain recommendations, the school district may put itself in an indefensible position when needing to explain questions that may arise or negative impacts that are perceived to have resulted from those decisions. The inconsistency that comes from picking and choosing NJDOH and or CDC guidelines on a case-by-case -case basis has the potential to diminish the confidence of the community create confusion and weaken the guiding principles upon which the school district bases its decisions. Operating in this manner may call into question or delegitimize the importance of all other guidelines that have been or will be put forth. Consequently, this could have the potential of intensifying controversy and opposition. The local health department has no firm basis to recommend a course of action contrary to the NJDOH and or the CDC guidelines. These guidelines are formulated by using a level of expertise, experience, resources, and data that local health departments and school districts simply do not have at their disposal. These guidelines are also made in consideration of other broad factors that may not be immediately apparent from a local perspective. For these and other reasons, it would be quite difficult for a school district to justify in a meaningful and demonstrable way why its health and safety policy did not utilize NJDOH and or CDC guidelines, or why a local health department would suggest or support alternative course of action that are contrary to the recommended guidelines. The health department's position should not be construed in any way to overshadow the fact that school districts may make any decision they choose without legal interference from the health department, provided these decisions are not in violation of the executive directives or executive orders of the state of New Jersey. It should be noted, however, that school districts may be obligated to these guidelines by other agencies or departments that oversee or regulate the district's activities or their standards and rules. So those are my words. This is just from Tom Cantisano, who would not be here today. 
So if I could just add, I guess, jump off of that. Everything that Mr. Kondasano or Dr. Kondasano uh, you know, said uh, it is accurate. You know, there, there is local control at this point. There is no mandate from the state uh, in terms of what health uh, guide, guidelines to follow. Uh, that being said, that there is liability concerns the further you deviate. Yes, there, there are other uh, states and other uh, entities that have um, you know, put forth guidelines or, or policies and procedures that, that differ from New Jersey. But in the event that there is a uh, lawsuit against the district, whether by a student, whether a staff member, uh, a visitor, uh, due to um, you know, COVID or any other health issue, the closer the district is to following the local guidelines, uh, the stronger a defense it will have against them. So uh, the most likely claim that we made in a case like this would be a negligence claim. And one of the defenses to an negligence claim is that the district followed um, the standard of care, which is set forth. And the standard of care that we looked at would be your local health guidelines. Uh, again, that doesn't mean there's a legal requirement that we follow those, but I, I think as um, you know, was indicated in that letter, the, the more deviation you have, the stronger medical basis uh, the district should really have to, to do that. Um, so you know, whether that requires you know, perhaps you know, Inquiry from the, the school physician, you know, if you want to get some input from him, uh, that might be worthwhile. Uh, but at the end of the day, there is no legal requirement to follow what the, the Department of Health, the local uh, Department of Health has, has uh, recommended, but there is liability concerns if the district were to, uh, you know, begin to pick or choose we're going to follow something else uh, without being able to demonstrably justify the basis for doing so. Well, it is interesting to note that the February 22nd update still says masks are required on buses. I know there's been a notification that that's changed, but it also says that when we're in red and we're playing sports that they should wear masks, which we never did. So there are some things that we didn't follow. There were recommendations that we didn't follow, thank God, because I really didn't want my daughter playing basketball in a mask. But there are some things that we're also now following. So when, you, when, when we're talking about consistency and following policies, again, I, I'm, my interest is, is really to alleviate what the staff's going through, the nurses, the tracking, and getting the kids down there, to get these kids back to normal as much as possible. And I can't seem to articulate a benefit. I mean, we had 52 kids in the test to stay and five tested positive in two weeks since the mask came off on March 7th. Yeah. So, okay, thank you for your comments. I, yeah. 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 But my, my point is that um, it's, I mean, do we want to take, do, do you? Yeah, no, I, I can just, I can speak for, uh, Myself as an elected official, I represent uh, the people who elected me, uh, and the people that, that I'm in touch with that been in contact with me support G uh, and to end contact tracing. Proceed then, Kyle. Should we vote to change the policy? Yeah. Should we? So, so your current policy, the, the road to um, go forward, uh, you know, clearly delineates that, that Diane has the authority as superintendent to uh, make changes. So, I think you have to modify the, the road forward policy. Uh, you know, if you want to change what was set forth in it right now. Okay, so um, we will vote on changing the uh, policy. Just one last question I want to finish with about Gene was um, when you change the policy, citing, um, I don't know, it said citing other data or something like that. But what was that part that you read? You, you read that, Gene, I think. It was like when you change the policy, when, of course, that's something from Tom that said. Well, it's verbally, he, when I spoke to him on the phone, he recommended that if you're going to change. You should cite other policies, other departments. Like if you had other authoritative bodies that had different policies, you could use them as a citing, as a reference. So, and I do have them. And actually, I sent I sent it to all of you guys. I knew I did it during today. You guys were all working. And it was 
busy day, but I sent them all to you so you can have the links to Massachusetts, Vermont, and Michigan. Um, so does that, Kyle, is that, does that help us, or does that not make a difference? It doesn't hurt you, certainly. I mean, uh, again, I guess that there's clarification. So you're looking to do it tonight, or you're looking to do it via a formal uh, you know, revision of the policy, you know, first reading, second reading, which would normally be required, uh, absent emergency. Tonight. 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 Yeah, please. Yeah, please. <laughs> Again, I, I, I think that the proper order would be to do it through policy committee to go through and revise have first reading, second reading. No. Again, that, that's what your your bylaws say. Vote, vote, vote. But you said we can't do it. What? How would you say you, you your, your bylaw uh, does provide for emergency revisions? I think you're you're in. Again, if you're going to justify this as an emergency, you know, you're putting your district at additional risk if something happens in the next month, not going through the normal process. Let's create an extra. Let's take the rent.